Welcome back. We are now ready to dive into our first topic on physics-based photoforensics, and this topic is vanishing points. One of my favorite topics, in fact, for a couple of reasons. The, the geometry and the mathematics here are really elegant and simple, number one. Number two is it describes some really nice phenomena in the world, and number three is whatever we learn here is going to help us downstream when we analyze reflections and shadows and other structures. Whether you're familiar with the formal concept of vanishing points in projective geometry or not, you're familiar with the intuition and the concept. So let's look at this photo right here, standing at low on a, a bridge on a beautiful fall day. Um, and the slats on the bridge, which let's agree are almost certainly in the physical three-dimensional world parallel to each other, they seem to converge to a point. So as we go further down that bridge, the, the bridge seems to narrow. Now, obviously, in the 3D world, that bridge is not narrowing. This is a pretty familiar concept. It's been around for hundreds of years. Artists have certainly known about this. They give us a sense of depth in a scene by exploiting projective geometry or this convergence of points. If you stand at uh, the head of uh, railroad tracks, those railroad tracks will, as they recede away from you, appear to converge. Obviously, they do not converge in the 3D world. Now, why is this interesting? It's interesting because there, we're going to be able to describe this mathematically. This is a property of the physical world. Yeah, this is physics-based forensics, after all. And when people manipulate images in 2D, they don't have a full understanding of the 3D geometry and often slip up and make mistakes that have to do with uh, vanishing points. And that's what we're going to try to exploit in this particular segment. All right, let me just start with a couple of insights about vanishing points and vanishing lines. We're going to play with the scene a little bit, so let me describe what you're looking at. This is a 3D generated scene. Um, I often use 3D uh, scenes because they, they sort of allow me to control things very nicely, and because they are physics, uh, physically realizable and physically plausible scenes, the geometry of what we see here maps over into the physical world. So in this case, you can see these three um, sort of boxes here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you those are actual real cubes. There's no optical illusion here. So those are actual cubes out in the world. And the floor, you can see, has this gridded pattern. And all of those lines, each one of those squares, the light and the dark ones, are actual squares. So all those lines are parallel receding this way and parallel receding this way. So really simple geometry, no tricks here, nothing funny going on. OK, fact number one about vanishing points. Parallel receding lines converge at a vanishing point. So what have I done here? I've taken a bunch of lines. Every blue line that you see here is on one plane, the ground, which is flat. And I've drawn lines on things that are parallel in the world. So every one of those lines along the grids are parallel. And notice that as I extend them out, and I've extended the boundary of the image you can see, they converge to a vanishing point up in the right-hand corner. That will always, always be true. Now, sometimes that vanishing point might be an infinity. If I was standing directly above that floor and looking directly down so that my optical axis was perpendicular to the floor, then those lines would remain parallel. And I'd still have a vanishing point. It would just be at infinity. Now, that doesn't happen very often because of the nature we, we photograph. Of course, if you have a drone looking down, you're going to have a little bit of a different vanishing geometry. Now, the question you want, I mean, so this is intuitive. We know this. We saw it in the previous slide. You see it with your own eyes when you look at parallel structures in the world. Just go look at a skyscraper and look up, and the skyscraper will do this. So we know that this happens. And the question is, well, why? And I'm not going to derive the full geometry, but I'm going to remind you that these are the perspective projection equations that we did in the first segment of this uh, class on, in terms of the background material. Let me remind you the notation. X, Y, Z, capital letters, are points out in the physical three-dimensional world. F is the camera focal length. And X and Y describe the projection of those points through linear perspective. And I've left off all those transformations of camera to world, world to camera to image, um, the camera center, all that, because this is really sort of what it boils down to, is that there is a nonlinear relationship between the horizontal position and the depth. And why does this matter? Is because in this scene, as I'm moving away from me, the viewer, the Z is getting bigger. And if Z is getting bigger, you can see the inverse proportion here, little x and little y, are getting smaller. So if those values are getting smaller, you get the convergence. So you can see why this is, at least intuitively, why you get that convergence from the perspective uh, projection equations that we derived in the first segment of this class. One of the reasons, by the way, why we do that. OK, now in that example, 
what I did is I took a bunch of parallel lines on a single plane, the ground plane. Here's a really nice property of vanishing points. Parallel lines on parallel planes converge to the same vanishing point. So what have I done here? I've got one line on the floor right here, another one coming in from the bottom here, I can't quite point to it, and then those two in the middle are from that cube in the far back, the top surface of that. Now let's agree that the top surface of that cube is not the same plane as the ground plane, but since that's a cube and it's resting flat on it, those are parallel planes. And notice that the sides of that cube line up with the floor. I've lined it up that way, unlike these that you see over here. So they have parallel planes, parallel structures on parallel planes converge to the same vanishing point. Okay. Very nice, nifty property of vanishing points. Okay, uh, number three. The vanishing points for all lines on a plane lie on a vanishing line. Okay, let's see what we're doing here. So in blue, I have two vanishing points, one all the way over here and one over here. So what do those correspond to? So this one right here corresponds to the parts of the floor tile that are running in this way, up into my left. This vanishing point all the way over here corresponds to parallel structures that are receding away into my right. So first of all, notice that I have two vanishing points. Why? Well, this is one parallel structure going in this direction. This is another parallel structure going in this direction. And those both are perfectly valid vanishing points. I draw a line between them. That's the red line that you see right here. And that is the so-called vanishing line. Okay, so the vanishing points for all lines on a plane lie on a vanishing line. That word all is important. I've just done two of them here. But if I had another different direction, well then, that vanishing point, because it's on that plane, that vanishing point is going to have to be on the line. We're going to see in a little bit near the end of the segment how we can use this forensically. It's a very nice property of vanishing points. So the vanishing lines connect vanishing points on a plane. Good. Moreover, I don't think it'll surprise you to learn that the vanishing points for all lines on parallel planes lie on a vanishing line. So this is sort of makes sense given that we already agreed that if you have two parallel planes, parallel structures on both of them, they have a vanishing point. There's obviously a common geometry there. So now what I've done is I have one vanishing point from the floor, another vanishing point from the floor, and what are these two in the middle right here? Well, this one is from the top of that, that box over there, different orientation, so it has a different vanishing point. So this vanishing point is not the same as this because the box is oriented relative to the floor. Same thing over here. I have a different orientation relative to this and relative to this. I have a different vanishing point. But notice that red line connects all parallel structures on parallel planes. That's incredibly general, and they all lie on that line. By the way, I won't derive this, but it's actually relatively straightforward to derive, is that the orientation of that line is uh, determined by the orientation of the camera. So the reason why this is perfectly parallel is because in my 3D scene, my camera was perfectly parallel to the ground plane. As I rotate the camera, you can sort of see it. As I rotate the camera, the image changes and that orientation changes. So that line right there, the orientation will tell you how the camera is rotated relative to the physical world. Okay, a couple more properties and then we're going to start deriving how you make these measurements and then how you use them forensically. Three, so we've seen two things, vanishing points on planes and parallel structures, vanishing lines on planes and parallel structures. Here's my favorite one, maybe. Three mutually perpendicular sets of parallel lines specify the image's principal point. So a couple of things to unpack here, let's do it slowly. So first of all, in blue in this thing, what I'm showing you are three vanishing points, one, two, and then at the bottom over there, three, and they correspond to three mutually perpendicular or orthogonal sets of parallel lines. What do I mean by that? Well, let's see. So one of them is from the face of the cube facing me. One of them is from the top, and the other is from a mutually orthogonal to both of those. Right? So this doesn't happen a lot in the physical world, but man-made structures like boxes, buildings, the sides of the buildings and the top or the bottom form three mutually perpendicular surfaces. 
for each one of those, I'm going to draw a, uh, a vanishing point. Okay? And then what I'm going to do is you can see I'm going to connect them with the red lines here. So there's one, there's two, and there's three. Those are the vanishing lines. They connect vanishing points. And I'm going to compute the so-called orthocenter. Okay, so what is the orthocenter? Notice that I've drawn a line from this vanishing point that is perpendicular to the opposing red line. I've drawn another perpendicular line from this vanishing point that is perpendicular to the opposite line. And I did another one over here as well. So you take each vanishing point, you draw a perpendicular line to the opposing side of the triangle. Those three lines should intersect at a point. That point is the so-called orthocenter, which is the principal point of the camera. What is the principal point of the camera? We did this in the uh, background section. It is that offset of the origin of the image coordinate system relative to the camera coordinate system. So it tells you basically where the optical axis intersects the image plane. It should be, but is not guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be somewhere near the center of the image. For variable focal lenses, that can move a little bit, but you typically expect to see that somewhere near the center of the image, which you can see with that red dot um, in the image over here. And we're going to use this uh, forensically as well in a little bit. Okay, so those are the properties of vanishing points and vanishing lines that I wanted you to know. There's, there's a few more. There's a lot of beautiful projective geometry out there, um, but those are really the core of it. Vanishing points on parallel uh, and, and planes, uh, vanishing lines, and the orthocenter, which tells you about the principal point or where the optical axis intersects the sensor in the image. Notice, by the way, that in each one of these, we are inferring something about the physical world. We are taking the image and we are asking something about the structures in the world or in the camera in the world. And that's, of course, the theme and the basis for much of what we will be doing today. Okay, so now we've got to put this into practice. Easy enough to, say, draw some lines, but we, we need to put this into practice and we need to be able to do this quantitatively. Now, obviously, you can open up your favorite drawing program and draw some lines and try to intersect them. But we really should do this numerically because you, you, very little, when you're intersecting lines, very little mistakes in where the lines are specified can lead to wild, wild variations in where they intersect, particularly as that vanishing point moves further and further away from the center of the image. So we're going to talk a little bit about the algebra behind intersecting lines and then how we use that to analyze vanishing points, vanishing lines, and orthocenters in a couple of forensic exa uh, examples. All right, so everything is about lines here, right? This is the game we're going to be playing. So let me start with intersecting two lines. Okay? A couple different ways you probably know to parameterize a line. I'm going to use these parametric equations, so let me go ahead and just describe these. So I have everything, by the way, we're in two space, right? We're not intersecting lines in three space. We're intersecting lines in the image. We are analyzing the 3D geometry that was projected into the image. So I have two points on a line, P1, little vector, X, denoted by X1, Y1, and Q1, denoted by U1, V1. So just two points in pixel space, nothing fancy. And I want to specify the line that connects those two. Okay, you can do slope intercept, you can do other things. I like these parametric equations, and you'll see why in a minute. So I'm going to parameterize this line as L1. One is just because I have the first line. I'm going to bring a second line in a minute. As, as a function of the parametric variable t, you'll see in a minute that t takes on the value 0 to 1, but also can go from minus infinity to infinity if we want to draw that line from minus infinity to infinity. That line is equal to, let's see, p1 minus q1 times t. Keep, keep track of those vectors, would you please? p1 and q1 are actual 2D points, times t, that's a scalar value, plus q1. All right, what's going on here? Let's see, when t is 0, what does this equation evaluate to? Well, I've got p1 minus q1 plus q1, so I just get p1. So when t is 0, I have this point right here. Okay, good. When t is 1, what do I have? Well, let's see, I've got p, uh, sorry, when t is, uh, uh, sorry, that was p, uh, t is 1, I get that point. When t is 0, what do I get? Well, that whole term goes to 0, and I get q1, I get that point. And when t is 1 half, I get halfway in between, and so on and so forth. So as t moves from 0 to 1, I move along the line. And as t goes negative, well, I just keep going. And as t goes past 1, I keep going from, uh, from minus infinity to infinity. Okay, so that's the parametric equation of the line we're going to use. 
Um, I like it because it's parameterized on that one parameter right there. And of course, any two points on the line. And that's more or less how we're going to be doing things forensically. You specify a couple of points on the top of the box, on the ground. I want to draw a line between it. There it is right there parametrically. Now, we want to be in the business of intersecting lines. So I want to know, do two lines, where do they intersect for a vanishing point? I want to know where do three lines intersect for a vanishing point? I want to know where does, uh, for that's for the ortho center. So we're going to start with two, and then we're going to figure out how do we do this for more and more lines, um, as we saw in the previous uh, slides up top. All right, so let's take another line. Uh, P2, Q2, parameterized by X2, Y2 and U2, V2. So I'm just switching the notation here. It'll help us keep track of things. But these are just two points in uh, a plane in the image. So this line is parameterized by L2 of T, which is P2 minus Q2 times T plus Q2. Same thing. When T is 1, I am at the point P2. When T is 0, I am at the point of Q2. And as I move T between 0 and 1, I move along the line. All right. Now, if these lines are not parallel, um, and or actually exactly the same line, then they will have one and only one intersection point. Let's not worry about the degenerate case right now. We'll come back to that in a little bit. So I want to know where do these two lines intersect, and let's work through the algebra to do that. All right, so what am I asking? I'm asking where does this line, L1, at some parametric value T1 um, equal this line, L2, at some parametric value T2? So notice that I'm asking, how much do I have to move along here, T2? How much do I have to move along here, T1, such that these two lines are equal? All right, we should be able to solve that. That doesn't seem too hard. Everything is linear here. All right, so let's write it out. What is L1 of T1? Well, I'm going to just drag that from right here. It's P1 minus Q1 times T1 plus Q1. So all I've done is replace the T up there with T1 because now we're searching for those two Ts. So that's line one. That's line two, P2, Q2, T2, Q2. Good. So here is a linear equation. Um, it seems like we might be in trouble because I have two unknowns, T1 and T2, but I only have one equation. But I don't have one equation because those are vectors. So this is actually specifying for the X and the Y coordinates. So in fact, I'm going to have two constraints, which you're going to see right now. So let's take the constraint we want, find me the parametric values for the two lines that give me the intersection point. All right, fine, write out the parametric equation for the lines. And now let's break this down into its horizontal and vertical components. Remember that P1 is X1, Y1, Q1 is U1, V1, same for P2, Q2. That's a vector right there. So I can write this in terms of the X component and the Y component. So this is X1 minus U1, that's the horizontal component of, of P and Q times T1, that doesn't change, that's a parametric parameter, uh, plus U1, that is the horizontal component of Q1. Same thing over here, X2, uh, U2 are the horizontal components of this, and U2. Okay, good, so that looks like one linear equation in T1, T2. Why do I say it's linear? I know X1, I know U1, I know X2, I know U2. Those are the points I specified on the line, and they are simply multiplying the unknowns, and there's no nonlinearity here. That's great news. Let me just rewrite this a little bit, reordering the terms to get all the unknowns on the left and all the knowns on the right. That's the standard game in algebra. So let's see. I'm going to take x1 minus u1 times t1. That's that term right there. I'm going to bring this term over here just by subtracting it. So minus x2 minus u2 times t2. And I'm going to move the u1 over here. So this is just u2 minus u1. Good. So this is now one constraint in two unknowns, t1 and t2. And now I'm going to do exactly the same thing, but for the vertical component of the lines. So I've got y1 minus v1 times t1 plus, v, plus v1. Got the same thing over here for the two. I'm going to move all the unknowns over here. That's this, all the knowns over here. And now I have two equations, one, two, in two unknowns, t1 and t2, which will give me the intersection where those two lines parameterized um, by the parametric equations intersect. So I've just carried over those two equations from the previous slide right here. And let's go ahead and solve. There's a couple ways you can do this. You can do this the old-fashioned way by isolating T1 here, substituting it into here, solving, and then backpropagating. You probably remember this from college. I don't like that way to do it. I, I, pre, I, pre, I prefer to do these things linear algebraically, so let's go ahead and do that. Okay, I have two unknowns, T1 and T2, and I'm going to set this up as a matrix problem and a matrix inverse solution. All right, so let's see what we're going to do here. 
I've got one constraint here and one constraint over here, and I'm going to argue that those two constraints can be written as one matrix equation like this, and let's see why. So let's see, this is x1 minus u1 times t1 minus x2 minus u2 times t2 is equal to uh, u2 minus u1. Good. So I've got a 2 by 2 matrix here, a 2 by 1 vector, and a 2 by 1 vector. So let's do the matrix multiplication. It's this row times this column is equal to that first element in the vector, and then it's going to be this row times this column is equal to the second element. So let's do the first one. It's t1 times x1 minus u1. That looks like that right there minus t2 times x2 minus u2, that looks like that term right there, is equal to u2 minus u1. Perfect. Good. We've got that. Let's do the next row. Uh, y1 minus v1 times t1, that's that term right there, uh, minus u2 minus v2 times t2, that's that term right there, is equal to u2 minus v1. Good. So that little matrix um, equation here embodies those two linear equations. Excellent. So, parametric equations that we said equal, we've rewritten in terms of matrix form. I have a two by two matrix here. Um, I'm not gonna, well, let me just solve this and I'll tell you where the, the singularities come in. That's my unknown. This is known, this is known. Two by two matrix, trivial to invert. So invert that matrix, left multiply it. That's that right there. There's your little matrix inverse, multiply it by that vector and you get your solution. Now, where's the degeneracy? The degeneracy is when that matrix is not invertible. That matrix will not be invertible when the lines are parallel or when they are on top of each other. And you will know that because the determinant of that matrix will be zero. So you can determine um, when it is singular and you can also determine when the lines are just barely non-parallel. You'll get an answer, but you have to look at the rank of that matrix. And if the rank of that matrix is really, really small, then you have trouble, you have in, you have, you're going to have instability in your measurement. So this matrix tells us a lot about the confidence that we will have in our intersection. All right, so that's easy, right? Just build a linear system, invert a two by two matrix, make sure the rank is, is, is reasonably strong, and you've got your intersection of two point, two lines. Now, if you remember back to where we were, we weren't just intersecting two lines. Like in that first example, I took a bunch of lines and I drew them out and they intersected at a point. And they intersected very nicely because I drew them that way and because I have a computer generated image without any noise and now there's no lens distortion and nothing. The reality of course is once you take more than two lines and try to intersect them, they're not going to quite intersect. There's gonna be a couple of pixels here and there. It's gonna look something like this. So look at these three lines here. One here, one here, and one here. Ideally, I'd want them to converge at a single point if I'm looking for a vanishing point or an ortho center where three lines converge. But more often than not, just due to the realities of in the wild analysis, you're going to be off by a little bit. Now, you've got to determine, am I off a little bit because the image doesn't satisfy the projective geometry vanishing point, vanishing line, ortho center of an authentic image, or is it just I'm off by a couple of pixels? We'll talk about that in a little bit. But for now, we actually need to be able to intersect not just two lines, but multiple lines, three or more. And we can't rely on the sort of perfect mathematical situation where we are guaranteed that they all intersect or they don't intersect. We've got to be able to deal with slop, and you know that. We can't just say if it's not within you know, perfect intersection, well, then it's, 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 it's fake. That, that's not going to work for us. So let's talk about how to intersect multiple lines. All right, so here's what we're going to do now. I've got three lines. Let's start with just this one line. I'm gonna put P on a line and Q on a line. Why am I doing that? Well, that's how I parameterize the line. So that line here is parameterized with exactly the same parametric equation as before. The other line will be and the other line will be. And what I'm gonna derive for you is how do we determine the V, the intersection point, that minimizes the perpendicular distance between every line and that point right there that you see in the middle of the black point that is denoted as V. So why am I picking that point? Well, look, I got three lines and they don't intersect. So I've got to come up with some measure of what is the best fit. And one reasonable measure is to pick the point that minimizes the distance to every line. And I'm going to pick the perpendicular distance because it's going to turn out to lead to a nice, clean, close form solution. It's not the only way to do it. You can do other things, but this is one way to do it. All right, so let's derive that. 
Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to derive where I got this equation, um, but I'm going to just uh, say it for you. It's actually pretty easy to derive, but it just takes a few slides, and I didn't think it was worth it. So the distance d, which you see on the slide right there, it's the distance between the line L, parameterized by P and Q, to that point that I want to determine, is equal to the norm, it's a distance we're calculating, between a vector n, I'm going to define that for you in a little bit, it's actually a row vector, that's a transpose, times n, my, sorry, times uh, uh, v minus uh, p. Okay, so what am I doing there? Well, let's see. n is this vector right here. Good, I'll derive that for you in a minute. p is the point on the line, and v is that point I'm trying to figure out. Okay, so the distance, the perpendicular distance between the line parameterized by p and q, that's a scalar value, to that point v is this. That normal vector is equal to the following. This little 2 by 2 matrix, this by the way you might recognize a little rotation matrix, and then q minus p, those are just, that's just a vector, divided by the norm of q minus p. Again, I'm not going to derive this. Um, it's actually, I'm pretty sure it's in the photo forensics book uh, that, uh, from, that I wrote, so if you want the derivation of this, we can go look it up in there. Okay? Now, why is that useful? Why is that distance useful? Because what am I going to do? I want to find the v that minimizes all of those distances for every line. So I've got one line, another line, another line. Each of those has a distance to some point v. I want to derive the v that minimizes the sum of all of those distances right there. That's what I said is my optimization. All right, let's write that out. E of v is an error function. v, of course, is that point we're trying to figure out, so it's an error function in the unknown that we want, is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to m. m is the total number of lines, 3 in this case. And what we want to minimize is, well, that distance that I just derived for you, or I just specified for you. So it's the norm of the i th n times v, that's what I'm trying to de derive, minus p sub i, the i th point. Okay? So we've got a bunch of pqs. We compute this normal uh, vector here, and I can now specify a quadratic error function to minimize in v. Okay, so now we need to do a little bit of algebra. So bear with me while I just crunch through this, because I think it's worth seeing. If you, don't, if you don't care about how I derive it, it's fine. You can just look at the solution, but I think it's worth seeing how to derive this. So this is a quadratic error function. I know it's quadratic because I've got a little square there, and I have a v right there. And we love quadratic error functions because they are convex, and we can minimize them in closed form using least squares. And the way we do that is we take that error function and we differentiate with respect to v. The derivative of that quadratic error function with respect to v is 2 times, well, let's see, I've got an n here times this thing here. So the n comes out, and then it's whatever this is again. So it's n transpose uh, v minus uh, p sub i, and that is the derivative. Okay, let me uh, work this out a little bit. So I have 2 uh, times n. Uh, let's just go ahead and work this out. So it's n times v minus n times p. Okay. The unknown is right there. That's the v. Everything else is known. Keep track of that. I know the normals. I can compute that because they only depend on p and q. I, of course, know p because those are the points on the line. So the only unknown is that little guy right there, which, of course, is what I'm trying to solve for. All right. There is the derivative of the quadratic error function. Since it's a quadratic error function, it's convex. And since it's convex, I know how to minimize it. Set that derivative equal to 0. It's a parabola or a paraboloid. And I'm going to set equal to 0 and find the value v that minimizes this. All right, this should be pretty easy at this point. All right, let's see. We've got a summation here. Um, there's, a, there's a summation right here. And so I can, I can break that up into two sums. So I've got 2 times n times n times v. That's that term right there. I've got another term, which is 2 times n times n transpose times p right there. And those are being added, so I can pull them out of the uh, summation. Why did I do that? Well, this thing right here doesn't depend on v, and this does. Well, okay, so let's get rid of the thing that do doesn't depend on v. Let's move it over to the right-hand side. All right, good. So now I've got this term here. Oh, by the way, look, the 2 and the 2, when I, bring, when I separate these, the 2 is going to cancel out, so we can ignore the 2. All right, so I've got this summation right here with the normals and my unknown v. I've got another summation here of a bunch of stuff that I know, so I can just go ahead and compute this. This is just going to be what? A vector. Yeah. And now, what is this thing? Well, let's see. It's a 2 by 1 vector times a 1 by 2 vector being summed up over and over and over and over again. And that's just a matrix. 
So this little guy right here, the V of course comes out because that doesn't depend on the indexing. That's a little matrix. Well, if it's a little matrix, I can invert it. Just a little two by two matrix. Take all those ends that you computed above, multiply them all together, outer product, uh, sum them up, and you get a little two by two matrix. That's a little two by one vector, and you're done. You got your solution. Okay, so if the derivation wasn't entirely obvious, it's okay. All you need to do is take your M points on the line, compute those normal vectors that I specified for you earlier, build that two by two matrix, build this two by one vector, just a little for loop, and then you've got your V that minimizes the average distance to the point um, that is perpendicular to each of the lines. Okay, so where would this come in handy? A couple places when you're computing a vanishing point from more than two lines, you're going to want to do this. Um, when you compute the orthocenter, so we've already talked about the orthocenter or the principal point, it is the very definition of an intersection of three lines. So let me remind you again, I've got three vanishing points from three mutually orthogonal surfaces like the sides of a cube, the side, the side, and the side. Um, I'm going to take each point and draw a line perpendicular to the opposing side of the triangle over here and over here. So right here, that's perpendicular, right here is perpendicular, and right here it's perpendicular. And I want to know where do those three lines intersect. Now, obviously, when there's a little bit of noise, it's not going to be a perfect intersection. So I have three lines parameterized with my parametric equations. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just derive for you that um, that I'm going to sorry I'm going to define for you n1, n2, and n3 as the normal from the point that goes perpendicular to the opposing side. And let me just go ahead and give you the functional form of that. Ah, that looks pretty familiar. Why is that right? Well, because we were minimizing perpendicular distances before, and these are perpendicular distances. So give me three vanishing points parameterized by P1, P2, P3. Spe specify these three normals, which go perpendicular. And now you have everything you need to compute the orthocenter. You've got these ends, you got the P's, build the matrix, build the vector, invert, solve, done. Good, all right, so let's see this put to use in some images. So this is an interesting image. It says spot, of course, instead of stop. And I love these types of man-made objects because lots of great parallel structures. And since these things are man-made, you really expect them to be parallel. So what do I expect to be parallel? Well, the sides of the stop sign, uh, these sides and these sides. So I've actually got three here. The sign post going up is parallel. And also the letters P and T along the stem of those, and maybe even along the top of the T, should be parallel structures too. Um, so let's see if this satisfies the expected projective geometry of vanishing points. So in blue, what I'm showing you, so let's first of all agree that the, all the structures, parallel structures in the world, on the stop sign are in the same plane. Obviously, it's flat. Uh, let's see, let's also agree that the stem of the stop sign, assuming that the stop sign is not rotated, is probably parallel to the sides of the stop sign. Okay, so that's a par and it's also a parallel plane relative to the spot sign, I should call it. All right, so I got one vanishing point over here. I have another vanishing point over here from the sides of the stop sign. I've got another vanishing point uh, right in the middle here in blue from the other sides of the stop sign. So I've got, and oh, and I've got, uh, so yeah, let's do that. So I've got one, two, three, and that red line is what? The vanishing line. And notice that all of those parallel structures from the stem and from the three sides of the stop sign all lie on a vanishing line. I've just drawn a line between those. That's as expected. By the way, notice that that vanishing line is rotated. Remember I said that that vanishing line, the orientation was how the camera is oriented. So whoever took this photograph was sort of doing this up and to the side, and that's why that line is so distorted. This is a real image that I created. I took a real stop sign and manipulated it. Now, look at the black lines here and off of, so those are off of the letter T and off of the letter P, the stem of those. And there you can see we have a problem. Those parallel structures are in the same plane as the stop sign but their vanishing points don't lie on the vanishing line. There's a problem with the projective geometry. Very clean, very simple, very easy to analyze. 
Here's another example. Uh, cargo ship. It looks like there's a big uh, crate there falling off of the crane. You see the green one seems to be falling. Man-made structures are your friend forensically. Um, all of those crates obviously have uh, uh, parallel sides, and they actually have three mutually parallel sides because they've got this one, the top one, and then the side one, and if you can see the other side over here and the bottom. We love cubes. We love rectangles. Those are our friends when we're doing projective geometry. So let's see what we find here. All right, so here what I've done is I've taken one of those crates, and I've, I've computed three vanishing points, one in the corner two, and then over here is three. Okay, so those are in blue. I've computed the ortho center, so I've taken every vanishing point and drawn a, a perpendicular line to the opposing side of the triangle, and I've intersected them, and that's what you can see in red right there. Okay, so is that right? Is it wrong? Well, we expect the ortho center to be somewhere near the center of the image. But this image looks like it's been cropped, right? The aspect ratio is a little funny. So maybe there was a little bit more image up top. Okay, so it's not terribly off. It's a little high up. But remember I said that when you have variable focal length cameras, that ortho center or the principal point where the optical axis intersects the sensor plane can move quite a bit, as much as 20% of the image size. So don't read too much into that, but we can at least look for consistency now. We may not know whether that's in the right place or not, but let's agree that the principal point uh, computed from these three um, vanishing points had better be the same as the, the principal point computed from any three uh, vanishing points, so let's do it again. And this time, let's do it from that falling crate, because that's sort of where the, the most interesting part of this image is. And now you see something interesting. So here, I've, again, I've computed three vanishing points, one, two, and three and I've intersected them to compute the principal point. Look where it is. It's outside of the image plane. That little red dot there is where they intersect. And now something is very wrong. And that's not a small difference. You know, you can chalk up a couple of pixels, five, six, seven, eight pixels in an image to just a little bit of instability in computing vanishing points. But when that principal point jumps by that much, now we have a problem with uh, projective geometry. And of course, I created this image, so I happen to know that I inserted that crate in there, and it does not satisfy. By the way, Go back and look at the original image and try to tell me if you think you can tell that the projective geometry of that is wrong. It is extremely difficult to infer whether projective geometry is correct. And that's your friend forensically because it means when people are manipulating images, they don't know how to get the projective geometry right. Unless, of course, they do the full analysis that we just did. Most people don't. Um, somewhere along in the syllabus, I don't remember exactly where it is, we're going to talk about human perception. We're going to talk about what is it that you are good at and what is it that you are not good at. And that's really important to understand for two reasons. One is that there is this tendency to look at image and say, well, it all looks right to me. But the reality is, is that when you are reasoning perceptually about 3D geometry, 3D lighting, 3D properties, it turns out our visual system has some interesting failures, and we're going to want to understand those, both so that we understand our own perceptual limitations, but we also understand that the mistakes that the forger will make, and then how we can exploit that. Okay, that was vanishing points, vanishing lines. We're going to use that basic infrastructure of intersecting two lines and three lines and ortho centers when we start analyzing reflections and shadows, and that's what's coming next. So if was, something was a little bit unclear there, please go back. Let's make sure we understand all the mathematics and algebra and linear algebra. We'll also be doing some exercises around this, and then we'll be ready to dig into reflections and shadows, which surprisingly, by the way, have a lot in common with vanishing points and vanishing lines. All right, we'll see you in a little bit.